All right, going to do one more video uh, specifically on the subject of this faith alone thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to keep going off about this because I've preached the gospel for years and years and years. I've preached the same gospel. Um, God came to save sinners. Uh, he draws sinners to a point of repentance. You're convicted by the sins that you commit and you come to a holy, righteous God and you call upon him and put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You get saved. God saves you, not you, okay? Your faith is just there as an act of you saying, reaching out to God. He reaches down to you with his grace and says, my son died for your sins, except to reject. You say, please accept. I'll, I have nothing that I can offer you, Lord. I, I'm a sinner. Please take me. I'll, you know, Tell me what to do. You change my life. You realize that it's going to mean a changed life. That's why a lot of people don't get saved. Truly saved. You get saved by an act of belief and faith. Okay? It's the same thing. I believe Jesus died on the cross, but I can't believe it by seeing it, so I have to put my faith in it. It's a past event that happened one time. Not like Roman Catholic salvation, which is continuous. I'm saved as long as I go to Mass and stay confessed up and die in a state of grace. As long as I'm committing venial sins that can be forgiven by my priest, as long as I pay enough money. You know, if I commit a mortal sin, I could be in trouble, but I can still get out if I go through purgatory for a while and burn for a little bit of time and there's people doing, you know, saying mass, Masses for me and all this stuff and giving more money to the Catholic Church. Um, and, the, you know, priest performs extreme unction on me and stuff as I'm laying on my deathbed and everything. Hogwash, okay? Baloney. <laughs> well, that's not biblical salvation. All right. You come to the Lord with an act of saying, I believe Jesus died for my sins, but I can't see it. So that's where my faith comes in. And then at that point, you're saved. You are born again, and God will start to clean up your life. The process of sanctification begins. All right. And you say, well, then where does the thing of a changed life come in? Well, that's the whole point. True salvation will produce a changed life every single time. What's the point of salvation if nothing changes? All right. So that's the debate with these people. But this faith alone thing, you know, I just want to make a couple more points. We're going to look up some scriptures on the subject of faith and see what the Bible actually says about faith. But this whole thing, uh, I saw one of you wrote, a brother uh, wrote, and he said, uh, you know, what confuses me about this thing is how can five solas be one system? <laughs> You know, it's like, you know, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone, in Christ alone, to God's glory alone. Wait a second. If it's five things, how can they each be alone? You know? So you see people, they say, I'm saved by faith alone. What they're saying by that, and of course they're deceptive with it. It's just some kind of weird, I guess you can't really call it double speak. It's more like quadruple speak or something. Um, but... Uh, actually, quadruple might be four. <laughs> Whatever. The whole point is confusing. Um, the whole point is, if you're saved by faith alone, faith is man's action towards God. So they're actually confessing that they are lost by their own profession. I'm not saved by my faith. I'm saved by God's grace through an act of my faith saying I put my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So when I say, somebody comes out and they say, I'm saved by faith alone, by grace alone. Wait a second, it can't be two alones. If you have two, they're not alone. Alone means one. So you say, I'm saved by faith alone. What you're saying is, it's my actions, it's my belief. And you get all these Satanists coming out and saying, well, yeah, that's all it is, my belief. They're saying that prayer is a work. Hyper dispensationalist is what these people are. Satanic heretics is what these people are. And they continue to come out with their little videos refuting me. Hyperdispensationalists, I'm going to be doing a study on them in the future. I've talked about it a little bit in the past, but hyperdispensationalists, just to break it down, they say that there are two bodies of Christ. Okay? The one preaching repentance, that's James, Peter, John, you know, all those guys. And then Paul brings in the gospel that we have today, and that's from Paul till the rapture. Okay, but you go to Romans chapter 16 and Paul is saying he's naming people who were in Christ before 
him. All right, they try to make baptism into a sin, but Paul baptized people. There's all kinds of these little arguments these people do, and what they are good at, they will go through the Pauline epistles and they will just chop the living daylights out of the Bible, and they'll just say, this is for us, this is not, this is for us, this is not, and they just go through and they just take all kinds of little stuff. I mean, they're, they're taking stuff out of the Pauline epistles and saying, Paul didn't write that to Christians. Romans chapter 10, you know, when it talks about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that wasn't written to Christians. Paul wrote it, and Paul's our apostle, but Paul didn't write it to Christians. He wrote it to some other group. And they just twist the scriptures and twist it and twist it and twist it, and you end up listening to these people. That's why I'm telling you, there are certain people, don't even listen to them, okay? They will mess up your head. They are speaking with devils, devils speaking through these people, all right? Hyper-dispensationalists are wicked. Hyper-dispensationalists, hyper-Calvinists, and charismatics, three groups that you avoid completely. They say, well, just open your mind. No, no, I don't think so. Satanic heretics, every single one of them. Hyper-Calvinist, hyper-dispensationalist, charismatic. Stay away from them, all right? They are the most satanic groups out there in professing Christianity. All right, very, very bad. But this whole thing of this faith alone movement, uh, it's, it's just, like I said, it's just, uh, brother brought that point up, you know, uh, how can you have five alones? Uh, it doesn't even work. You know, only one thing can be alone. Okay, five cannot be alone. They have other, you know, this one has the other four. But again, you know, we'll explain this stuff to these people. You can't. Okay, they're the natural men, as the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I think it is. You know, they can't receive the truth. They're dead in trespasses and sins. So, you know, not going to happen. Um, let's, but let's look at about this word faith. What does this word faith mean? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 15 through 25. We're going to look at the very first time that the word faith appears in the King James Bible. Uh, if you haven't ever heard this before, there's a thing called the law of first mention in your King James Bible. Many times, when a word is used the first time, it will be defined within the text. So let's look about this. Deuteronomy 32, beginning in verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art mindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So these people are rich, they're fat. In other words, uh, being overweight means you have enough money to buy lots and lots of food. So many cultures say if somebody's fat, they're rich. But they are rich, and they're going after other gods. Verse 19, And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of, his provoking, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a froward generation. Here we go. Children in whom is no faith. Let's continue. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, and devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them, with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without, and terror within... Hmm shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I'd have throw that verse 25 in there, very, very telling for today. 
when you have a nation that forsakes God and starts to say, we want uh, same-sex rights and we want to have all this LGBTQIR4963-8 or something, all these new designations and stuff like this, you know, um, it, it's insanity. These people forsake the Lord. That's why you see tornadoes, earthquakes, flooding, avalanches, all this other stuff that's happening. And people coming in, heathen people coming in with knives and killing people and murder and death in the streets and all this other stuff. People forsake God. That's what happens, right? But look at verse 20. Children in whom is no faith. Does faith come from God or from man? You see, the problem is when people begin to get very wicked, they lose faith in God. Faith is man's reaction to God. Why? Because man can't see God. What can they see? They can see stuff here on the earth. Money, false idols, false gods, things like that. They can see those things. So they have no faith in the invisible God. Deal with atheists. You'll get this thing. Oh, you and your, your fake sky God and all this other stuff. They'll make fun of the Lord. Why? Because they're children in whom is no faith. Faith, you see, is the evidence of things not seen. Let's look about that. Habakkuk. Turn back towards the New Testament to the Minor Prophets. I know some of you are newly saved and you're probably going, what's a Habakkuk? <laughs> you know, uh, well, you get into the books of the Bible there towards the end of the Old Testament and you get all these very interesting names. Um, but uh, they're the minor prophets there. And uh, there's some interesting things in there. And we're going to see one of them. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Interesting. But at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Everything that's in this Bible has an appointed time. And I've said this thing just as a, because I hear it and I repeat it. And I say, you know, if the Lord tarries, another year, the Lord's not tarrying. Do you understand that? And I, I've apologized before for saying that. That's not true. <laughs> I just said it because I've heard it and I repeat it. Because it sounds right. Because you think to yourself, what on earth is the Lord waiting for? He must be waiting. The Lord's not waiting. He knows exactly when the rapture is going to be. All right. He knows exactly when the Antichrist is going to come to power. He knows exactly when the, he's going to stand in the temple, showing himself that he is God and, and run, you know, flee into the mountains if you're in Judea. He understands exactly the exact second. He's not tarrying. All right. But look at verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Is it God's fault if you mess up and stop looking for him and go back to the world? So, well, Lord, it was my fault. I mean, I stopped reading the Bible and I stopped witnessing to people and I stopped listening to the right kind of music and I went back to the world and I did this and that because you didn't provide me with enough faith, God. I know. <laughs> faith is our job. The just shall live by his faith. I have faith every day that the Lord's going to provide for me. I have faith that my Lord and Savior knows the exact time when He's going to say, come up hither. I have to live by faith. I can't live by sight. You can't live by sight as a Christian. You have no idea what tomorrow's going to bring. Do you? I mean, how many times have you been in life and you have enough money in the bank and you have, you're in good health and things are all planned out and it's like, I got to get to work tomorrow or whatever else. And all of a sudden you go out and it's like, how did I get a flat tire in my vehicle? What in the world? You go and you call your boss, you say, hey, I'm going to be a little bit late. Sorry, I got a flat tire. I just got to go out and change it quick. You go out and you change it. 
go to turn the key on and oh, my battery's dead too or or whatever you get up in the morning you're like oh man what in the world where the, how did I get a headache and oh. or you get to work and you're you're there working and stuff and all of a sudden it's like oh it's starting to hurt a little bit when I swallow and you come home later that night and you're sick as a dog within the next couple of hours we don't know what a day is going to bring forth you see so we have to live by faith whose job is faith our job the just shall live by his faith so well, this is all in the old testament this is all in the old testament okay let's go to romans chapter one I might do a study in the, on this in the future sometime, um, studying the Old Testament from the New Testament. Uh, there's a lot of New Testament quotations that are actually from the Old Testament. They're quoting things in the Old Testament. So the, the you know, New Testament is actually complementary to the Old Testament. It's not overthrowing the Old Testament. And I kind of find it a little bit interesting that a lot of Jews today are like, you know, the New Testament attacks the Old Testament and stuff in the Old Testament ways. And yet they themselves aren't keeping the Old Testament laws and things and animal sacrifice system and whatever else. Kind of interesting, you know. They themselves aren't keeping the Old Testament, but they attack the New Testament because it supposedly overthrows the Old Testament while they're in a religious system that has overthrown the Old Testament. Uh, the issue is about Jesus, by the way, if you don't understand why the Jews reject the New Testament. It's because of Jesus. But that's going to change soon. But let's check out here Romans chapter 1. Verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, study the book of Acts, came to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. Whenever you see that, that's somebody in the New Testament quoting the Old Testament. As it is written, or it is written. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Old Testament, the just shall live by his faith. Okay? That's how the Lord inspired this thing. Interesting. So is faith our job or God's job? Our job. So when you have somebody say, I am, you know, salvation is by faith alone. If they truly mean that, that salvation is by faith alone, then they're basically saying salvation is my job. It's all on me. I put my faith in something I've believed. I don't even have to, to call upon the name of the Lord. I don't have to pray anything. I just believe I'm saved and therefore I am. And I can continue in sin. I can do what I want. I'm saved. By their own admission, by saying salvation is by faith alone, sola fide, you know, they are basically saying, I'm lost. That's what they're saying. Absolutely, whether they like to admit it or not. But I'll give you another one people tried to quote as proof or something. Luke chapter 7, verse 50, you have the story of this woman coming in and she's washing, you know, Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping him his feet with her hair and everything and what does jesus say to her verse 50 and he said to the woman thy faith hath saved thee go in peace and they say see faith alone he didn't mention anything else it's like okay um he didn't even die on the cross yet okay um if her coming in and wiping you know crying on jesus's feet and then wiping his feet off with her hair and stuff why is she doing that She's coming to him as a sinner, right? saying, I know he can save me. I know he can heal me. The plan of salvation hasn't even been fully realized yet. So if Jesus had been telling her, hey, you're saved now. You're born again. He didn't even die on the cross yet. Why would you use this as a proof text to try and prove faith alone? See, not a very good argument. Not a good argument at all. And again, I'm not saying faith has no part of salvation. You know, I get this thing, people saying, you know, Brian Ellinger's teaching works salvation. I'm going, what? <laughs> you know, of course you get the hyper dispensationalist, Ed Fakinger and all these other little little satanic followers of her of hers, well, his, um, 
And they're saying, you know, that prayer is a work and stuff. Yeah, Martin Richling started this whole thing and these little devil worshipers follow him. You know, uh, Martin Richling, the Jesuit, uh, and he was. He was a Jesuit, definitely. Eric Phelps told me that. He used to work with Martin Richling. And again, I've, you know, dealt with that in the past. But, I mean, prayer is a work. Okay, uh, belief is a work. You know, you have to believe. Therefore, it's a work. I mean, it's just... These people are, are mentally ill. But you have that group, you know, that's saying faith alone and, and you, there's no whatever and stuff like this. And they say I'm teaching works because I teach prayer. You know, you pray to the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You have that group, you know, saying I teach works. Then you have the non-dispensational crowd and they're saying because I say salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble is faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments, according to Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, I'm teaching works for today. And I'm going... I mean, these people are so mentally ill. You know, the posties and the hyper-dispensationalists, um, they're mental, mentally ill. You know, the one says, prayer is a work, so I'm teaching works salvation. The other says, he teaches uh, faith, you know, faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments in the time of Jacob's trouble, so that proves that he's teaching it for today. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, and then works in the millennial kingdom, so that proves that I'm also teaching you know, I teach three gospels apparently for today, and I, you know, and people have put this stuff on me. You know, they they really honestly believe this way. They really honestly say these things, because I teach different plans of salvation. They said the same thing about Ruckman. He teaches five different, you know, salvations. You know, in the New Testament, for today. Be careful what you believe about Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, okay? I, I had my issues with the man, some of the little things and stuff, whatever else. But the guy was saved. He was a great Bible teacher. You can learn a lot from the man. And for somebody to say he was teaching five different Gospels for today shows that they are 100% liar, okay? I was trying to think of another word there, but liar does it very nicely. Uh, I don't teach multiple plans of salvation for today right now in the church age. There are multiple plans of salvation in the New Testament because the New Testament was written to different groups of people. That's not Old Testament for the Jews, New Testament for the Christians. Let's look at a couple other verses here. I'm not going to be going through. I mean, you can look up. You want to do a word study, just go through faith and you're going to see it's on man. You know, it's, it's man, man's response to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's the whole thing. That's what it, faith is if you want to boil down description. The other definition of faith, of course, we'll be getting into this here in just a little bit, but the other definition of faith is the faith, like the Christian faith, okay? Um, meaning, you know, Christianity. We'll see about that here in just a minute. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Just give me a minute. I've got to do something here real fast. I'll be right back with you. All right, sorry about that. Right back. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 21 there, it talks about repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's salvation. The two parts, it's one event, all right? Repentance toward God, what is that? I am a sinner. I have no more self-righteousness. I'm not a good person. I need to come to you in repentance. I'm sorry for who I am. I'm sorry for what I am. I'm sorry for what I've done. I can't possibly make it into heaven with my goodness. Okay? Repentance toward God. You're asking for His grace, for His mercy. That's why you're coming to Him. That's why you're calling upon the name of the Lord. You see? You're crying out to God going, God, I don't even know how to pray. I don't know what to do here. Please be merciful to me, a sinner. He's not unto all them that call upon Him. Okay? He's there. He wants to hear from His creatures, His creation down here. And you call upon the name of the Lord. You say, God, please. And the Lord says, I've offered my Son. Jesus died for your sins. All those things that you're ashamed of and that you're saying, I'm sorry for that. Jesus died to pay for that. He say, where? I'd, I'd like to see this. Well, that was uh, nearly 2,000 years ago back there in Jerusalem. Well, I can't, I, I wasn't there. 
sorry, you didn't make it then. You had to be right there. And there was, you know, they were handing out little, they had one of them machines with the little tags that you buy, you know, number two, number three. It was just one day only, one day sale. You missed it. Well, it's, I mean, a little sarcastic here. Uh, no, no. The blood was there at shed at Calvary, but it's still available today. You say, where is it? I can't see it. That's where faith comes in. We're not saved by faith alone, you see. It's repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Not my opinions. Okay, you understand? You know, salvation is simple. And when you come to the Lord in repentance and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross, He'll change your life. It's wonderful. Such a blessing to be to have that life-changing experience. To have the Lord come into your life and start to tell you, Hey, son, I want you to clean that up. You need to get that out of your life. And God, will, He'll have mercy on you. I mean, some of us were in really rough shape when we came to the Lord for salvation. And the Lord says, Hey, you know what? you got a lot of things there that need to be cleaned up. And you say, Oh, boy, I'm just going to have a busy... And the Lord says, We'll take, you know, let's, let's take some time. And... Some of it is a very slow process. Some of these things are very hard to get rid of. And it's not because it's a more powerful devil that's infested you or something. <sighs> Nutty charismatic stuff. No, it's just there are things that your flesh has a harder time giving up. All right? I didn't have any problem at all giving up alcohol when I got saved. You know why? Because I never messed with alcohol. But I had a very difficult time giving up pornography. But you have some brother or sister out there that has a hard time with alcohol but had no problem with pornography. You see? Would it be right for me to judge them because they're having a hard time with giving up their alcohol? No. Would it be right for them to judge me because I had a hard time giving up pornography way back when? Praise the Lord, I'm clean of it now for many, many years. No. Okay. But the whole point is where you start to question people is when you see that that struggle's not there and you see that they have no problem with certain sins that are clearly condemned in Scripture and you go, wait a second here. Are you sure it took with you? <laughs> you know? And again, it's not because we're trying to condemn other people and say, you're a false convert. Go to hell and burn. No, no, no. We're saying, hey, I think you might be a false convert. I think that this might not have worked for you. Please make sure that you're saved. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. We want people to be saved. That's the motivation behind this ministry. When I come out and I rebuke certain things and I say, you might not be saved if you believe this or if you do that or whatever else. I'm trying to get people to get saved. Examine yourself. You see, I'm not trying to be an island with all my little followers camping with me and only people that I accept, you know, and give my stamp of approval, they're the only ones that are saved. That's not it at all. You know, even though people try to put that on me. I want to see people get saved, genuinely saved. Go next to Jude. This will be the other type of faith that you're going to see in the Bible. And I think there's like 200-something references to faith. That's why we're not going to go through all those references. Um, you can do it if you want to. Uh, unique study and things. But uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 3. There's only one chapter. Uh, verse 3 here, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So what's its talk, what, it's, what it's talking about there is what happened once. Jesus Christ died on the cross once to make atonement. Okay, You don't have to say, well, yeah, you know, I need to put my faith in, was it the third or fourth or fifth time that Jesus died on the cross? No once. That's the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Okay, So the Christian faith is there. So you'll see those two different things. The just shall live by his faith, but then there's also the faith of Jesus Christ right there. All right, Talking about the Christian faith. All right, So get that thing straightened out. Uh, there's never a time in Scripture where you have faith is something that is imparted to you from God. Okay, no. <laughs> It's our job. We can have faith. We need to have faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. All right, you know, you get into the, again, you get these hyper dispensationalists. They'll start to start to get into hyper Calvinism then too, because you know, 
all our sins are paid for and stuff like this, and therefore they were probably paid for earlier. So we're probably predestinated, pre-elected and stuff. And I've, I've known hyper-dispensationalists. I've gotten into conversations with them. They start to go to hyper-Calvinist. I've seen that a couple times now. They're hyper-dispensational. They'll go to hyper-Calvinist. A hyper-Calvinist, by the way, if you don't understand, a hyper-Calvinist is somebody that takes Calvin's five points there and they just, that's their whole world then, to put it in simplified terms. And one of those things is unconditional election. In other words, Jesus died for a certain group of people, and if you're elect, if you're one of his elect, you cannot do anything to not be one of the elect. Okay, You're chosen, you're, the, you're in, whether you want to or not. If you're a non-elect, you can't do anything to get saved. Ridiculous, nutty nonsense. It's satanic heresy. But, you know, these hyper-dispensationalists, they'll start to get into that type of a me mentality where, you know, you're just, you're saved and you really don't have to do anything. See? Hyper-Calvinist. You're one of the elect. So you don't have to pray. You don't have to do anything, apparently. God just does everything. His, the faith, you know, the faith alone thing, it comes from God and He just puts everything on you and you're just this holy vessel walking around the earth or something. They can sin and do whatever you feel like doing and God doesn't have any controversy with that. There doesn't have to be a changed life. You're just, you're in. And you know, they, they don't like that kind of thing. We'll look at the last reference to faith here in the Bible. Revelation chapter 14. But uh, they, they don't like that. You know, that's not what we believe. And then you find out that these liars, that's, that's exactly what they believe. Again, you know, that's why I say, if, if you find out somebody's a hyper-dispensationalist or a hyper-Calvinist or a charismatic, stay away from them. Right? When you see that pride rising up, you're wasting your time with those people. Okay? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. This is the last verse, last reference to the word faith in your King James Bible. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There are commandments that are going to be there in the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't have to keep commandments today to be saved. Did you hear me? We don't have to keep commandments today to be saved. I know that some of them still didn't hear me and they're making videos right now and posting comments and things and getting in their little forums and whatever else to call me a heretic again and whatever else. He's preaching different gospels of salvation for today. Uh, no, that's in the time, excuse me, the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Keeping the commandments. What are the commandments in that time? Well, the Sabbath day shows up again because it's in Matthew chapter 24. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath day comes back in the time of Jacob's trouble. It goes to the Jews. The Jews require a sign. That's the whole point of the book of Revelation. So, I mean, this stuff's so easy to get, unless you're lost and then you you're dead in trespasses and sins, and that's why they can't understand. But the other commandment, the most important commandment in that time of Jacob's trouble is don't take the mark of the beast. If any man takes the mark, he goes to hell. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. Read it. There's no question. You know, Ken Hoven was questioned in the Jeffrey Grider's uh, program, and um, some guy called in and said, you know, if, what if somebody, a Christian, takes the mark of the beast, um, and uh, could they... Will they keep their salvation? Hoven's like, I, I don't know. I, I think so. You know, I, I'm not really sure. How can you not be sure? Revelation chapter 14, 9 through 11 is crystal clear. You know, so there's a salvation by faith and works in that time period. That's what's going on in James chapter 2. Faith and works, you know, James chapter 2, verse 17. You know, if even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. The only verse of Scripture where the words faith and alone appear in the same verse. And it's talking about faith having to have works along with it. And again, you know, people are saying, always teaching works salvation. I'm going, I'm not teaching works salvation. I'm teaching it, you know, it's going to be there in the future. It's not for us today. But, you know, sometimes, brethren, you just have to tell, tell the truth and just preach the truth. And, and what happens is... You know, it's just kind of like going up and whacking a, a hornet's nest to see if there's anything in it, to see if it's active or not. You just kind of whack the thing and say, oh, here comes some hornets. I think I'm going to go away now. <laughs> you know, um, the heretic hornets uh, are swarming out more and more as time goes by. 
Um, those of us that are Christians and we just look at the Bible and we go, yeah, I can understand salvation. I understand what Brother Brian's saying and other brethren out there that are saying that salvation produces a changed life. I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, Jesus Christ is the cure for your sins. Here, take the cure. Is it going to heal me? No. You know, well, it might. But it's just like, how can people not understand what I'm saying? There's a change. It's a wonderful change. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Unless you're any number of easy believers and heretics, you know. Then there doesn't have to be a change. There can be, but there doesn't have to. It's like, you know. But we can look at the Bible. We can say, I, got, I understand it, you know. Uh, hey, the rapture, the body of Christ is going to be leaving before God pours out his wrath. Yes. <laughs> it's not difficult to understand that. You, you, you know, I'm saved, but God's going to put me through his wrath and judgment on the earth. Why would he do that? You know, he sends the two witnesses for the body of Christ. Why? You know, it's just the Bible's really not that hard to understand in many of these areas. It's just simple things but see lost people come in among our midst and they say well what about this argument what about that and i have scriptures that disprove you and blah 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 blah. you know see that's the whole issue these people that are raising all these questions and things like this coming along and saying you know yea hath god said um uh, you know these people are lost and that's why it's like we don't mesh it's like that fellowship's not there. But you meet a Bible-believing Christian, and, and it's just like they can be any kindred, any nationality, ethnicity, whatever you want to say, race, whatever. They can be anything like that, man, woman, old, young, whatever. And it's just like there's that fellowship, the fellowship of the Spirit. And that's something that lost people can't imitate. They can try, but they can't really imitate. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me yeah, I started listening to Stephen Anderson. I started listening to this false prophet or that false prophet. And I was like, yeah, yeah, good at first. But it was like, you start getting this sickening feeling like, uh, something, wait a second, what did he just say? Something doesn't sound right here. You know, I mean, that's going to happen if you're saved. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to what somebody is saying. That's why I see a lot of times people come here and they say, you know, well, brother, you know, I don't agree with everything you say, but I know you're, you love the Lord and you're saved and everything else. Well, praise the Lord. You know, great. You don't have to agree with me and everything, you know. But I see some of these other people. Yeah, I used to listen to him and he's really going off the deep end, you know, and stuff like this. And I'm going, how have I gone off the deep end? I still, to this day, that, that just is, is a mystery to me. I mean, go back to 2009 you know, when I was really, 2008, I was putting up some other videos and things, logging type of stuff early on, and some fishing videos, um, and a wood turning one, I think, too, if I remember correctly. But uh, go back to 2009 when I was really getting active on YouTube and watch the stuff I put out back then, my audio sermons, and then compare it to what I'm saying today. There's very been very little changes. So these people that say Brian's really fallen away, I'm going, uh, <laughs> no, you've fallen away. So that's going to be it for this little short study. Um, got a lot of stuff uh, right now I'm trying to get done, I'm trying to tie up some other research. You know, research gets in the way of so many, you know, things. <laughs> uh, it's just incredible. You know, the Lord shows us stuff. We get people sending us letters, sending us books, information. They're like, could you please check this out? And it's like, you know, I got so many different, you know, pots on the fire, as they say. You know, just so many different things on the fire, just cooking, you know. It's like cooking like 50 different recipes and you're running from one to the next and you're going, oh, that's right, was I supposed to put pep pepper in this one or in that one? You know, and you're putting the spices in and you're, you know, and stuff. I mean, there's so many things going on here and I thank the Lord for it. It's great, you know. And then my wife, you know, uh, she also adds to the whole thing. She's doing her own research and ladies write to her and they say, could you, you know, give me an answer on this or that or whatever else. And so, <clears throat> very active in ministry and uh, so... Um, going to be some more interesting stuff coming out in the future, but I just wanted to make a couple of videos today to just kind of catch up. But, uh, you know, I've had some other issues and things. The sump pump issue, just to let everybody know, thank you for praying about it. Um, some of you made some really good suggestions. 
great suggestions, which I took some of the advice, um, and uh, it's working a lot better now. So I'm not going to get into a whole lot of that right now, but um, maybe in the future, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, it's working a lot better. Uh, I thank the Lord we were supposed to get like this big snowstorm here in New England. The New England states got hit pretty hard, even down south of New England. And uh, here in Aroostook County, we, I mean, we barely got a dusting up here. So I uh, got a little bit. It was just really blowing really hard. So thankfully, uh, there's not a whole lot of snow. I love snow normally, but there's not a whole lot of snow to dig out or anything else like that. And uh, we have a lot of projects coming up outdoors, uh, things that need to be done. And uh, so I'm really glad that we didn't get another, you know, 20 inches of snow or something like that. Um, so... Uh, that's a good thing, but um, I guess that's going to be it. Still working on Revelation chapter 13. Uh, there's, you know, that's going to be a tough one to do. Uh, these Revelation studies are getting harder and harder <laughs> to do because it's just like, wow, there's there's just so many things going on there, and a lot of it's just I don't understand exactly what's happening because it's not pointed dispensationally at me, but I'm trying to get instruction and righteousness type of stuff out of it. But it is what it is. Uh, going to be trying to bring that stuff out in the future. But um, as far as the Revelation studies. But I uh, have some other things planned too. But um, please do keep us in your prayers. Uh, like I said, we have some real big decisions coming up this year. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on, on a lot of that right now. But um, real, real big stuff. Uh, it's all about uh, our lives just to... Just to say it this way, um, we're both dedicated to the Lord 100%, and we're going to stay in ministry um, as long as we possibly can. I know a lot of you really appreciate the ministry. We appreciate you. We appreciate your letters and things, and just words of encouragement is the most important thing uh, to us. We really appreciate that, um, and uh, we want to be here for you. So everything that we do, from this day forward, uh, we're trying to make the ministry more efficient. And, um, you know, there's a lot of plans that we have on that, but I'll get into that in the future more on that. So that's going to be it for this study. I'm not going to keep making videos on the whole faith alone, you know, scam thing, because it's, it's not in the Bible. And these people, when they say faith alone, they're Faith is something that we're supposed to have towards the Lord. Uh, God doesn't grant us faith. Okay, He gives grace. And it's our faith that believes what Jesus Christ did. And our faith that believes that the Lord's going to provide for us. Faith is the just shall live by His faith. That's what faith is. So somebody comes along and they say, I'm saved by faith alone. They are literally admitting to being lost. Because they're saying that it's my faith faith that saves me so that's about enough of that i'm going to get on to other subjects so thank you very much for watching thank you for your words of encouragement and your prayers we'll see you in the next study